sickle. Bleeding saints and forest witches, the past unburied, the books unsealed, the old celebration returning. Hello and welcome to my study. Uh, please come in, have a seat. All the books surrounding you are those used to uh, research our show. And the uh, individual to my right here, along with managing domestic duties, serves as our uh, reader for any passages that will be directly quoted from these sources. Her name is Mrs. Carswell. Hello. I do hope everyone is staying safe and healthy out there. Yes, uh, of course, on all fronts, health and finances. And as far as our own problems with uh, our neighbor in the woods, I'm happy to report that there have been no further disturbances on the property and that uh, Mrs. Carswell's hives have also gone unmolested for the uh, last two weeks. Thank heavens. However, we did find something in the back, some sort of uh, droppings or waste, uh, human or animal, I'm not sure, but we're going to find out through uh, Fish and Game Services whenever they make themselves available again. I've saved them for analysis. Or I saved them. You wouldn't touch it. My hands were full holding the plastic bags. And I don't think it needs to be in the refrigerator. It's disgusting. Well, it's necessary to uh, slow any biological breakdown. They should be able to tell if it's uh, a bear through what it's digested, or if it's human. God knows what Mr. Petrovich should be eating out there. Or drinking. Mm. And I do have an email out to a professor in Bucharest who's uh, an expert in the Usari, the uh, hereditary bear training tribe from whom I believe Mr. Petrovich may be descended. But uh, no response on that. Uh, other than that, the only other excitement was my brief panic I experienced last Thursday when I believed I'd discovered Mrs. Carswell's secret drug habit. You know Mother listens to these shows. I'm not saying you're a drug fiend. As it turns out, the syringes for injecting bee venom, which I suppose is not unusual for beekeepers, and injecting the stuff for purposes of uh, desensitization. That's one reason. It's also the health benefits, particularly now when boosting immunity is so important. Well, anyway, nothing your mother would find shameful. Not true. We don't believe in injections. It's not the same as venom from the bee. That's where the real benefits come in. Physical, mental, spiritual. I just don't want to disturb the bees outdoors when it's cold, and I can't do it here like at home. Not without a dedicated winter room. A warm room where they can fly freely. So normally you would submit yourself to... Yes, but they don't sting out of anger. Not how we do it. There's no anger, no fear. It's not frightening. Well, not for you, maybe. I've done it since I was a child. Maybe the first time I was a bit frightened. It was a big event and I was nervous, but... It was special, too. I was 12, and it was on the summer solstice, and all the family came. I was shivering a bit, but it wasn't fear. It was because I was naked. N naked? Why? I'm not sure. It's how we do things. But I was never afraid after that night. Ah, well, I... Uh, okay, um... I really don't have any response for that so um, on that note I suppose let's just wrap this up so we can get started with episode 46 a journal of the plague year I am your host, Al Reidenauer, and this show, Bone and Sickle, explores the intertwining of horror and folklore in a historical context. I uh, started this show as a way to uh, further explore this area of intersection after writing my book, The Krampus and the Old Dark Christmas. 
Bone and Sickle only exists thanks to the generosity of our Patreon donors who receive a number of unique and, and sometimes handcrafted rewards uh, related to the show and its themes. And I'll have more on uh, Patreon at the end of the episode and hope you'll consider doing your part to keep this show coming out regularly. Thanks to those of you who responded positively uh, regarding more episodes addressing uh, plagues throughout history. We have another one tonight, of course, uh, which uh, hardly exhausts the topic, but uh, we'll probably be switching off so it's not all plague, all the time format, as you get enough of that from the uh, news these days, I'm sure. The sweet sound of misinformation, an appropriately dark rendering of a children's rhyme, we're told, has dark roots in the uh, Black Death. Oh, if only this were true. Unfortunately, um, this theory, which first appeared in the 1950s and is now ensconced in thousands of websites, has actually little to support it. The rhyme is not noted anywhere till almost two centuries after England's last major plague. It also depends on uh, particular lyrics only appearing in uh, even more recent versions. Uh, Earlier iterations, for instance, had the uh, players curtsying rather than falling down, uh, presumably dead of the plague. Um, Likewise, with uh, perceived references to sneezing, not a symptom of bubonic plague, or um, rosy rashes, wasn't the rosy death. And there are a hundred pleasant enough reasons to carry posies other than to uh, ward off bubonic plague, especially in a stinking sewage-filled 17th century city. If you'd like to have a look at uh, connections between the plague and uh, nursery stories, I would refer you to an earlier show, episode 7, on the Pied Piper, in which we cover that as well as uh, plague-related phenomena such as the flagellants and dancing mania. There's a bit about the uh, connection between vampires and the plague in our Shroud Eaters episode. So, this last major outbreak of plague in England, which I referred to, is the Great Plague of London, which took place from 1665 to 1666 and claimed nearly a quarter of the city's population. Specifically, we'll be looking at an account of those years written by Daniel Defoe, better known, of course, as the author of Robinson Crusoe. And uh, though it's usually referred to simply as a journal of the plague year, its full title is... A Journal of the Plague Year, being observations or memorials of the most remarkable occurrences, as well public as private, which happened in London during the last great visitation in 1665, written by a citizen who continued all the while in London. Now the thing is, Defoe was five years old in 1655, and the book was published in 1722, so it's uh, technically a work of fiction. As the uh, narrator is identified by the initials HF and... uh, said to work as a saddler, it's generally assumed to be a version of the experiences of Defoe's uncle Henry Foe, H.F., who uh, also was a saddler and lived through the plague. Other named characters within the story are nearly all actual individuals, and particular events described can often be corroborated in contemporaneous accounts. Particular dates and locations are also meticulously anchored in reality. So much so that scholars still debate whether the book ought to be classified as fiction. And it's a hundred times more entertaining than Robinson Crusoe. So a good part of our show will be direct quotes from Defoe's text, starting with... I must go back to the beginning of this surprising time. While the fears of the people were young... They were increased strangely by several odd accidents. In the first place, a blazing star or comet appeared for several months before the plague. 
There was not only one comet visible over London, but two, one in December 1664 and another early in 1665, and a third visible elsewhere. In New England, for instance, a Puritan author also took this uh, view of the comet as an omen, writing, There with long bloody hair, a blazing star threatens the world with famine, plague, and war. Anyway, back to Defoe, he continues, I think the people were more addicted to prophecies and astrological conjurations, dreams, and old wives' tales than ever they were before or since. Whether this unhappy temper was originally raised by the follies of some people who got money by it, that is to say, by printing predictions and prognostications, I know not, but certain it is, books frighten them terribly, such as Lily's Almanac, Gadbury's Astrological Predictions, Poor Robin's Almanac, and the like. Also, several pretended religious books, one entitled, Come Out of Her, My People, Lest You Be Partaker of Her Plagues, another called Fair Warning, another Britain's Remembrancer, and many such all or most part of which foretold directly or covertly the ruin of the city. This is only a sampling of the doom-filled pamphlets devoured by London citizens of the day, and almanacs, which uh, of course were filled with astrological predictions, sold only second to the Bible in those days. It didn't help matters that the year 1666 lay on the horizon, a time anticipated over fearful decades for its association with the number of the beast. Charles II had just ascended the throne in 1660, ending that turbulent, bloody reign of Cromwell's, but not the apocalyptic dreams of uh, revolutionary dissenters. The list of these is quite impressive. There were Baptists, Anabaptists, Barrowists, Beminists, Brownists, Ranters, Diggers, Levelers, Enthusiasts, Familists, Fifth Monarchists, Grindelatonians, Mugglatonians, Quakers, Philadelphians, Ranters, Sabbatarians, Seekers, Socinians, and, of course, the Puritans. The outbreak started slowly enough in the spring of 1665, but by the summer was in full sway, driving those who could afford it to flee the city. Defoe describes the mood of those who remained behind. London might be well said to be all in tears. The mourners did not go about the streets indeed, for nobody put on black or made a formal dress of mourning for their nearest friends. But the voice of mourners was truly heard in the streets. Tears and lamentations were seen almost in every house. A dreadful clamor mixed or compounded of screeches, cryings, and voices calling one another. Whole streets seemed to be desolated, and not to be shut up only, but to be emptied of their inhabitants. Doors were left open, windows stood shuddering with the wind in empty houses for want of people to shut them. In a word, people began to give up themselves to their fears and to think there was nothing to be hoped for but a universal desolation. While many gave up hope, others, the uh, pamphleteerian set, saw the situation as an opportunity for expressing their religious zeal. One of the better known of these was the uh, Quaker Solomon Eccles, whom Londoners knew as Solomon Eagle. A former composer, he seems to have gone quite mad during the epidemic. He, though not infected at all but in his head, went about denouncing of judgment upon the city in a frightful manner, sometimes quite naked and with a pan of burning charcoal on his head. To be fair, burning anything that produced smoke was considered a way to combat the perils of the uh, plague-bearing air, the miasma mentioned in our last show. But it hardly ends with this gentleman. Next to these public things, 
with the dreams of old women, or should I say, the interpretation of old women upon other people's dreams, and these put abundance of people even out of their wits. Some heard voices warning them to be gone, for that there would be such a plague in London, so that the living would not be able to bury the dead. Others saw apparitions in the air, and no wonder if they who were pouring continually at the clouds saw shapes and figures. Here they told us that they saw a flaming sword held in a hand coming out of a cloud with a point hanging directly over the city. There they saw hearses and coffins in the air, carrying to be buried, and there again heaps of dead bodies lying unburied. He also reports encountering a crowd gathered around a woman wrapped in visions, convincing many that there in their presence stood an angel clothed in white, with a fiery sword in his hand, waving it or brandishing it over his head. Another crowd gathering around an old man who is... Affirming that he saw a ghost walking upon a gravestone there. This ghost, as the man claimed, made signs to the houses and to the ground and to the people, intimating that an abundance of the people should come to be buried in that churchyard, as indeed happened. One mischief always introduces another. These terrors and apprehensions of the people led them into a thousand weak, foolish, and wicked things. And this was the running about to fortune-tellers, cunning men, and astrologers, a wicked generation of pretenders to magic, to the black art. These businesses, as they propagated throughout the city, hung out shingles advertising their services, he says, using an image of uh, Friar Bacon's brazen head the mechanical all-knowing head of legend discussed in our Lost Heads episode, and others advertise themselves as being in communication with the long-dead seer Mother Shipton, discussed in our Cave Witches episode. One mischief was that if the poor people asked these mock astrologers whether there would be a plague or no, they all agreed in general to answer yes, for that kept up their trade. And there was brisk business done in... Charms, filters, exorcisms, amulets, and I know not what preparations to fortify the body against the plague. Those who could hardly afford these items nonetheless snatched them up quickly, only to find their true worth later. Such customers, he observes were afterwards carried away in the dead carts and thrown into the common graves of every parish with these hellish charms and trumpery hanging about their necks. And those pretending to a more worldly knowledge, the medical science of the day, also hawked their wares, promoting themselves in handbills, for example, as... An eminent high Dutch physician, newly come over from Holland, where he resided during all the time of the Great Plague last year in Amsterdam, and cured multitudes of people that had actually had the plague upon them. Or... An Italian gentlewoman just arrived from Naples, having a choice secret to prevent infection, which she found out by her great experience, and did wonderful cures with it in the late plague there wherein there died 20,000 in one day. One of these quacks makes special appeal to the destitute, advertising that he gives advice to the poor for nothing. When the poor consequently came flocking to him, he made a great many fine speeches, examined them of the state of their health, and of the constitution of their bodies. Inevitably, every consultation ended with his recommendation of one particular remedy that might preserve them from an otherwise inevitable and painful death. The cost for this particular uh, physic he advertises, or medication that is, is half a crown. But sir, says one poor woman, I am a poor almswoman and am kept by the parish and your bills say you give the poor your help for nothing. I, good woman, says the doctor, 
So I do as I publish there. I give my advice to the poor for nothing, but not my physic. Not so easily defeated, the woman stations herself outside his place of consultation, complaining loudly of his tricks. Till the doctor, finding she turned away his customers, was obliged to call her upstairs again and give her his box of physic for nothing, which perhaps too was good for nothing once obtained. So what exactly was driving all this? Defoe provides some good detail on the bubonic plague and those buboes that affected the lymph nodes. The swellings generally in the neck or groin, which were called the tokens, were really gangrene spots or mortified flesh in small knobs as broad as a little silver penny and as hard as a piece of callus or horn, so that when the disease was come up to that length, there was nothing could follow but certain death. The course of the disease was generally quite swift, so that some victims would be taken suddenly very sick and would run to a bench or any convenient place that offered itself, or to their own houses if possible, and there sit down, grow faint, and die. But the progression of the disease was not always so merciful. The swellings, when they grew hard and would not break, grew so painful that it was equal to the most exquisite torture. However, if these swellings could be brought to a head and to break and run, or as the surgeons call it, to digest, the patient generally recovered. Or at least there may have been symptomatic relief. Uh, To aid in this process, physicians applied violent drawing plasters or poultices to break them. And if these did not do, they cut and scarified them in a terrible manner so that many died raving mad with the torment, and some in the very operation. And not all sufferers were willing to submit to such treatments or passively endure the pain of the disease. Some broke out into the streets, perhaps naked, and would run directly down to the river if they were not stopped by the watchmen or other officers and plunge themselves into the water. And some not able to bear the torment, threw themselves out at the windows, or shot themselves. There was also one man in or about Whitecross Street, burned himself to death in his bed. The city also responded with mitigation efforts of its own. Authorities mandated closures of public gathering places and activities. The official ordinance quoted in the book provides some insights into exactly uh, how Londoners occupied themselves in those days. This uh, prohibition lay on tippling houses, music houses, public dancing rooms, gaming tables, puppet shows, bear baiting, singing of ballads, rope dancers, jack puddings, and Mary Andrews. The last two being names for clowns who might draw crowds with their street performances. Men called rakers were employed to move the filth normally accumulated in the streets to manure in waste pits called lay stalls. And uh, special care was to be taken with stinking fish or unwholesome flesh or musty corn or other corrupt fruits. And of course there was the quarantining of the sick, rather more severe than our uh, current shelter at home orders. Homes that housed individuals suffering from the plague were ordered shut up with watchmen posted at the door to ensure that those within, sick and healthy alike, remained incarcerated until the afflicted either recovered or was carted off to the plague pits. Closed houses were painted with red crosses and the words, Lord have mercy on us. Lest there be any doubt as to the dangers within. Occasionally, those thus imprisoned would find ways to evade the watchmen, escape through upper windows, or bribe their way out. While this would be more likely in the case of those apparently healthy, clearly diseased individuals sometimes also slipped by the watchmen. Defoe gives us an example of the panic that might ensue there. This poor man came out into the open street, 
ran, dancing and singing and making a thousand antic gestures, with five or six women and children running after him, crying and calling upon him for the Lord's sake to come back, and entreating the help of others to bring him back, but all in vain. Nobody dared to lay a hand on him or to come near him. And a more dreadful case he relates involves a substantial citizen's wife and a man who is going along the street, raving mad to be sure, and singing. The people only said he was drunk, but he himself said that he had the plague upon him, which it seems to be true. And meeting this gentlewoman, he caught hold of her and pulled her down also and kissed her. And which was worst of all what he had done, he told her he had the plague, and why should not she have it as well as he? She was frightened enough before, being also young with child. But when she heard him say he had the plague, she screamed out and fell down into a swoon or in a fit, which killed her in a very few days. I never heard whether she had the plague or no. A tally of the dead was kept by the various parishes and reported to a central examiner's office, which posted lists called bills of mortality. To obtain these numbers, parishes employed individuals known as the Searchers of the Dead, who moved among the sick and dying and, like the doctors, nurses, and burial attendants, were compelled to identify themselves by carrying a red rod or wand of three feet in length which should also be used to prod and poke at the bodies to determine whether they were indeed dead by plague. Because of their exposure to these dangers, the searchers, who were usually older women from among the poorer classes, were subject to a sort of quarantine of their own and were obliged to live apart from the community. Given the risks and poor compensation for the work, the searchers of the dead were known to also sometimes accept bribes from families trying to avoid quarantine by having a loved one's death by plague attributed to another source. Those who actually fell dead on the street, Defoe says, were, if possible, covered with cloths or blankets during the day, but not moved until nightfall. To avoid distressing the citizens, it was only under the cover of darkness that the dead carts rolled out and bodies were moved here and there and buried. But as the epidemic progressed, There was scarce any passing by the streets, but that several dead bodies would be lying here and there upon the ground. On the other hand, it is observable that though at first the people would stop as they went along and call to the neighbors to come out on such an occasion, yet afterward no notice was taken of them. And indeed the work of removing the dead bodies by carts was now grown so very odious and dangerous that it was complained of that the bearers did not take care to clear such houses where all the inhabitants were dead, but that sometimes the bodies lay several days unburied till the neighboring families were offended with the stench and consequently infected. And in some cases... Bodies were so much corrupted and so rotten that it was with difficulty they were carried. A particular plague pit, one of many used, is described in the narrative. It's a trench, 40 feet long, 15 wide, and filled to the depth of 9 feet. That is, uh, mostly filled with bodies and earth by the time our narrator visits Uh, The bodies were layered day by day, covered with earth each morning to prevent those distressing sights and smells. Almost like a lasagna, actually. Earth and bodies. Um, This particular pit, Defoe says, at its digging was intended to hold the uh, 50 or 60 victims lost in a week, but by August 1665, that number had risen to a total of 200 to 400 weekly. Another, he mentions, holding... 114 bodies had been intended for a month's use and was filled in a mere two weeks. A morbid fascination overtakes our narrator who is eager to see the graves, but... There was a strict order to prevent people coming to those pits, and that was only to prevent infection. 
but after some time that order was more necessary, for people that were infected and near their end and delirious also would run to those pits wrapped in blankets or rugs and throw themselves in, as they said, bury themselves. Though he has already observed the pits by day when no bodies are to be seen, he later resolved to go in the night and see some of them thrown in. He hurries toward the pit as he hears the approaching sound of the bellman who rings warning before the carts piled with corpses, and recognizing the attendant at the pit, he tells him, I have been pressed in my mind to go, and that perhaps it might be an interesting sight that might not be without its uses. The attendant agrees. Twill be a sermon to you, the best that ever you heard in your life. Tis a speaking sight, and has a voice with it, a loud one to call us all to repentance. And with that, he opened the door and said, Go, if you will. As he draws near the pit itself, he beholds... A mournful scene indeed, awful and full of terror. The cart had in it sixteen or seventeen bodies. Some were wrapped up in linen sheets, some in rags, some little other than naked, or so loose that what covering they had fell from them in the shooting out of the cart, and they fell quite naked among the rest. Even more distressing in its way is the bereaved father and husband who shows up as his family is consigned to the pit. He is pacing about, muffled up in a brown cloak, and making motions with his hands under his cloak, as if he was in great agony, and the barriers immediately gathered about him, supposing he was one of those poor, delirious, or desperate creatures that used to pretend, as I have said, to bury themselves. Recognizing the situation, they send him away to be taken in by a nearby tavern, one which the narrator himself visits when he concludes his uh, observations at the pit. He arrives there at one in the morning, but finds the brave man still in the tavern, half senseless in his grief. Hearing the bell of another cart drawing near, the drunken patrons crowd to the windows. And looking out, and hearing sad lamentations of people in the streets or at their windows as the cart passes, they made their impudent mocks and jeers at them especially as they hear the poor people call upon God to have mercy upon them, as many would do at those times. Their cruel mockery is then directed toward the bereaved man. They taunted him with want of courage to leap into the great pit and go to heaven, as they jeeringly expressed it, adding some very profane and even blasphemous expressions. Upon this... I gently reprove them being well enough acquainted with their characters, and not unknown in person to two of them. At this, our narrator becomes the object of their hellish, abominable raillery, as they mockingly demand why I was not at home saying my prayers against the dead cart coming for me and the like. After enduring a further bout of blasphemies and invectives, our narrator retreats from the tavern, only to report that... They continued this dreadful course three or four days. I think it was no more, when one of them, particularly he who asked the poor gentleman what he did out of his grave, was struck from heaven with the plague and died in a most deplorable manner. And in a word they were, every one of them carried into the great pit. If we're to consider notions of God's unslaked wrath upon the city, and as we're near the end of this episode and the end of Defoe's book, there is a sort of coda to this tale of misery, a disaster which superseded the Great Plague, the Great Fire of London in 1666. This song is strongly associated with the 1666 fire, though the version known today was clearly written later as it contains references to fire engines. 
A similar song, however, an older song, but around like this one that we're hearing, is Scotland's Burning, which was likely inspiration for this one. The Scottish songs believed to describe the burning of Edinburgh in 1544, so perhaps a song like this was known during the Great Fire of London. While it was commonly believed the fire somehow put an end to the plague, the death count had already begun to drop some time before. In any case, it was certainly not an easy time to live through and perhaps offers a comparison, making our own contemporary situation a little less bleak. There is one final story from a journal of the plague year, which I'd like to relate, one that happens to tie in with another song. It's about a bagpiper who earned what he could performing in various taverns before they were closed by the mayor, that is. It was but a very bad time for this diversion. Well, things were, as I have told. Yet the poor fellow went about as usual, but was almost starved. And when anybody asked how he did, he would answer, the dead cart had not taken him yet, but that they had promised to call for him next week. Whether somebody had given him too much drink or not, I do not know. It happened one night that this poor fellow was laid out at a gate in London Wall. Observing the piper passed out by the gate and hearing the bell of an approaching dead cart, a neighbor said to have laid a body really dead of the plague just by him, thinking too that this poor fellow had been a dead body as the other was, and laid there by some of the neighbors. Accordingly, when the cart driver came along, finding two dead bodies there, he took them up and threw them into the cart, and all this while the piper slept soundly. From hence they passed along and took in other dead bodies, till the piper was almost buried alive in the cart. Get all this while he slept soundly. At length the cart came to the place where the bodies were to be thrown in the ground. As soon as the cart stopped, the fellow awakened and struggled a little to get his head out from among the dead bodies, when, raising himself up in the cart, he called out, Hey there, where am I? This frightened the fellow that attended about the work, but after some pause he cried, Lord bless us, there's somebody in the cart not quite dead. Where am I? the piper asked again. Where are you? says the driver. Why, you are in the dead cart, and we are going to bury you. Insisting that he isn't quite dead and needn't be buried, the piper is assisted off the wagon and wanders off into the night, perhaps a little wiser about his uh, drinking. I don't know if this passage happened to have influenced the dead cart scene in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I'm not dead! Yeah. He says he's not dead! Yes, he but is. it's not... safe to say that Defoe's story itself was uh, influenced by another legend, a story not restricted to London, but one which appeared 43 years before Defoe's book was published in a 1679 plague ordinance issued in the city of Vienna. Included in this document as a sort of cautionary tale, oddly enough, is a story featuring the very same character, a drunken piper ending up, passed out, and among plague corpses. And four years before this, the same story is told in a sermon by the Viennese priest, Abraham a Santa Clara. There is an actual historic figure of Vienna about whom the stories come to be told, Marcus Augustine, a minstrel and a piper who lived through the Great Plague of Vienna in 1679. While there aren't many biographical details in this character, and our knowledge is mainly restricted to this legendary anecdote, he is well known throughout Austria and other uh, German-speaking countries through a song that was first documented in the 1800s, though it's uh, said to have been written by Augustine back in the days of the plague. It shares a tune with the English-language nursery song, Have You Ever Seen a Lassie? Oh, du lieber Augustin, 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 oh, du lieber Augustin, oh, lass es hin. However, the song is quite a bit more grim than your typical nursery song, or you might say it's as grim as we'd wish Ring Around the Rosie might be. Uh, using the uh, old word pest in place of plague, as in German and Old English, the verse could be loosely translated thus. 
Oh dear, Augustine, everything's gone. Money's gone, girl's gone, shirt is gone, walking stick gone. Augustine lies in filth, our great happy fest. Now is just pest, pest, pest. Just a funeral fest, all that is left. Oh dear, Augustine, everything's gone. Well, all this is bleak enough, but I'm not leaving you with that. What's important is that the song, which has another couple lines comparing Augustine's plight to the suffering of the city of Vienna during those times, is one that's been triumphantly embraced by the Viennese for centuries as a sort of anthem of survival. Augustine does, after all, manage to scramble out of that pit full of corpses as the city itself pulled itself out of its own collective misery. As I'm sure we ourselves will all manage to do when this bit of unpleasantness ends. I hope everyone's been enjoying our show and that you might have the opportunity to share episodes with friends if you do. We uh, heard and would love to continue hearing how this show helps entertain and distract you during these uh, times of the self-quarantine. If it's done so and you are able, we'd also love to have your support through Patreon. Under the circumstances, we are also experiencing some uh, extra difficulties in getting these shows out, so very much appreciate any donations you can make. You can find our donor link on boneandsickle.com or just Google us. Patreon members have a choice of rewards, including exclusive access to uh, extra elements that go into the making of the podcast, uh, digital downloads of rare books used in the program, the show soundscapes you hear in the background, my uh, Krampus book, and a special mystery kit mailed to our top-level donors. Donation levels begin at $1 a month, and your support via Patreon is the sole support that goes for the more than 100 hours of work that goes into each episode. I do want to thank our new patrons, and a few I accidentally omitted last episode. Uh, These kind souls are Jim Mason, Audrey Pearson, Nigel Bundy, Penny, Time Chaser, Rickman, Ariana Wheat, and Ro Rosencrantz. Hi, Ro. He's a member of our Krampus troupe. And uh, also want to thank Aaron Bobak and James Doyle for upping their pledges. And I want to thank Nigel Bundy for his uh, kind review on Apple Podcasts' UK site. I should mention that we Americans are unable to access the international versions of Apple Podcasts. So if you've left a review on one of those, uh, please let me know so I can thank you. A screen grab would be nice, too, if possible. We do understand that things are a bit tight now. So if you can't donate, another thing you could consider doing to help the show would be to leave a review. If you haven't yet, you might want to uh, visit our website, boneandsickle.com. There you'll find links to our Facebook group, Twitter, and Instagram, along with show notes with plenty of images and video links to film trailers, clips, and music used in the program. Sound Design Otherwise is original for the show. Bone and Sickle is written and produced by me, Al Reidenauer. Mrs. Carswell is played by Sarah Chavez, whose projects and writing related to death and culture you can track at sarah-chavez.com. Thanks so much for listening and stay safe.